Hi there and welcome to the channel of a disappointed man with me Jason Kennedy the disappointed man and in this video I'll be talking about Russell Hoban's 1980 novel Ridley Walker but before we come on to a discussion of the work itself let's begin as per usual with a biographical sketch of our author. Russell Hoban was born in 1925 in the USA and after serving as a radio operator in World War II he began a career as an illustrator and copywriter before publishing his first children's book What Does It Do and How Does It Work in 1959. For the next decade he wrote exclusively for children and many of his books were illustrated by his wife Lillian. However their relationship broke down in 1969 during a family holiday to London with Lillian and the children returning to the US and Hoban remaining in the capital where he would reside for the rest of his life. In the 1970s he began producing novels for adults alongside his books for children, a number of which were illustrated by the great Quentin Blake. Now the bulk of Hoban's work, whether for children or adults, falls within the fantasy genre although they are sometimes described as works of magic realism. While Ridley Walker stands alone among his output, constituting, as it does, his sole foray into science fiction. Now, before coming on to the story, it's necessary to address the fact that Ridley Walker is a notoriously difficult read, and that's because Hoban not only imagines his setting, an England of the far future, where the aftermath of nuclear war has so devastated human civilization that it's been reduced to the point where farming is only just taking over from hunter gathering as the preferred means of subsistence. But, and herein lies the singularity of this work, he also imagines the language these people will be speaking, a barely recognizable form of English. And it's in this invented language that almost the entire text of Ridley Walker is written. The simplest way to demonstrate what I'm talking about is if I just read the opening paragraph of this novel and that will lead naturally on to a discussion of the story. I'll also put it up on the screen so you'll get a taste of the I dialect which I'll go into more deeply in my analysis. On my naming day when I come 12 I gone front spear and kilt a wild boar. He probably been the last wild pig on the bundle downs. Anyhow there hadn't been none for a long time before him, nor ain't looking to see none again. He didn't make the ground shake nor nothing like that when he come onto my spear. He weren't all that big, plus he looked it poorly. He done the required. He turned and stood and clattered his teeth and made his rush. And there we were then, him on one end of the spear kicking his life out and me on the other end watching him die. I said, your turn now, my turn later. The other spear's gone in then and he were dead and the steam coming up off him in the rain and we all yell off it. This opening not only shows how far we are from a conventional reading experience where meaning is so easy to grasp that the text feels transparent but it also introduces us to Ridley Walker, the 12 year old boy who will serve as our guide on an adventure where he himself frequently becomes lost and has to turn to others, even to other species, to find his way forwards. I won't go too much further into the story as I don't wish to spoil it for anyone other than to say that, as this opening suggests, death and Ridley's process of self-discovery are closely intertwined throughout this narrative which covers the events of just a week or so. And the fact that it takes over 200 pages to work through these events and explore their potential meaning is in keeping with every aspect of this novel as Hoban seeks to draw the reader as close to Ridley and as deeply into his world as possible and it's the various ways in which this sense of immediacy is achieved that will provide the focus for my analysis. The first aspect I'd touch upon is the time of the narration. Now I've mentioned this literary term in previous videos and what it denotes is how distant in time the narrator is from the events being narrated and in the case of Ridley Walker he is extremely close both in time and space to the events he so vividly describes. Indeed, he's writing his account while the potentially lethal consequences of his actions and the actions of others have yet to fully play themselves out. This creates not only a sense of urgency, but also an accompanying feeling, not so much of suspense, but of contingency. 
as if the outcome of what we're reading has yet to be determined. And all of this serves to pull the reader close to the moment at which the action is occurring. A second aspect that generates a sense of immediacy is Ridley's intense engagement with his environment. Much of the novel's action takes place outdoors and through Ridley we're brought into contact with the contours of the landscape, with the elements, with the night. Not just through his words, but through his eyes, his ears and his skin. And this creates a strong sense of being there. The final aspect that produces a sense of immediacy is the invented language itself. Now it may seem paradoxical that what makes this such a hard text to read should also bring us closer to the teller and his world, but it does so, in my view, in three ways. The first of which is Ridley Walker's status as a SCAS narrative. SCAS is a term coined by my favourite literary critics, the Russian formalists, and it denotes a written narrative that seeks to imitate a spontaneous oral account through its use of dialect slang and the peculiar idiom of that persona. Now, in the case of Ridley Walker, his narrative is scars by default. There are no dictionaries available to him. So to read his words is effectively to hear his voice, which means while we may be distant in time, instead we feel ourselves close to him in space. Secondly, there comes a moment during reading as one becomes more acquainted with Ridley speak, as it were, when a sudden shift occurs and one feels inside rather than outside of this language, and thus a member of Ridley's linguistic community. For me, this moment came around page 50 or 60 or so, and after that, the poetry of this text became much more apparent. However, once one becomes comfortable with the language, Hobart begins upping the ante, as it were, and some of the discussions in the middle of the novel are almost, if not completely, opaque, and they rather point towards this definitive break between their world and ours, and this produces some of the most poignant moments in the novel. Lastly, Ridley Walker's use of I dialect, misspellings based on standard pronunciation, often used to denote a character is illiterate or uses non-standard pronunciation, differs in three significant ways from how the technique is typically applied, and I'll use Zora Neale Hurston's wonderful novel, And Their Eyes Were Watching God, for the purposes of comparison here. Firstly, the extent of the use of eye dialect in Ridley Walker is extreme. As I noted previously, almost the entirety of the text is presented in this way, whereas in Zora Neale Hurston's novel, it's confined to the speech of the characters and the third person narrator uses standard English. Once again, the case of Ridley Walker reinforces the immediacy we feel when reading because we know we're reading his own story told in his own words. Secondly, with Ridley Walker being set in the distant future, its use of I dialect suggests alternative etymologies for words in a way Hurston's novel does not. For example, Ridley spells smoke, S-M-O-A-K, and this presence of oak within smoke potentially points to how Ridley connects these two phenomena. In similar fashion, there are many examples of polysyllabic words which Ridley breaks into pieces. However, his rendering of them often functions as a pun, as a kind of commentary on the actual meaning of the words. So, Official secrets becomes fictional secrets, a misspelling which has a particular resonance in the world of the story. The final way in which Ridley Walker's use of I dialect differs from Hurston's is in the use of delayed decoding. And this is when the full meaning of a textual unit only becomes apparent later in a text. And here I'll use the example of the word Burke in Ridley speak, B-I-R-K. It appears a number of times in the story, but it was only on perhaps the fourth or fifth appearance that I realised it was Ridley's way of rendering the word brick. So there we have it. That concludes my analysis. This book is a treat for both ear and eye. I could have gone on and on actually because it uses many more literary techniques. It's a fascinating book, quite possibly a work of genius, and I can't recommend it 
strongly enough, despite the difficulties of getting into it, it is one of the most rewarding books I think I've ever read. So a huge thumbs up for Ridley Walker and all that remains is for me to bid you farewell. So be safe, be strong, and I shall see you anon. Nanu nanu.